Finally, this day is here. This is the day that we have been waiting for all this time. The marriage supper of the Lamb. I just received a huge confirmation to make this video, so I'm going to get right into it because the Lord wants you all to know these things. I've kind of hinted on it in other videos before, but I feel that God wants me to do a more thorough job. So I'll most likely be putting scriptures throughout the video on the screen. So please watch the screen so you can see any additional information that I do put on the video. So I'm going to get right into this. So there's a groom in a Galilean wedding and he wants to marry a bride so the bride and the groom come together at the gate and anyone who is aware that this ceremony is about to take place they also come running from all over the village to see this event take place and you have to think of it too at the time Tiberius Caesar was in power so the saints were being persecuted heavily. There was, you know, a lot of most likely depression, suppression, uh, oppression, all of that, just persecution. So to hear that two people wanted to get married was like a highlight of the day. It was a huge event for Galileans to get married. So people would come from all over to see this betrothal, to, to see this, this man and this woman make vows marriage vows and the the way a galilean marriage is done is completely different from anything that we in our western culture are aware of so please soberly listen to what i'm gonna what i'm saying because i'm gonna tie this into the rapture the wedding supper of the lamb and explain what that's all about and all of this stuff okay and this is just things that the lord has, has taught me so everybody would come together the groom's father would also be there and the bride's father would be there and so they would come together and then the father of the groom he would read a marriage proposal and once he reads everything like the terms of this marriage proposal you know in a western culture we have vows at a wedding you can think of it that way and where the the, the pastor says different parts of the agreement and when a people come together in marriage they're agreeing to those terms and conditions and so the father of the groom will say these things and then the groom to know if the wife accepted or not he would present her with a cup and if she didn't accept she would not drink of the cup but if she accepted she would drink of the cup and dear heavenly father Please help me, Lord God, because I'm willy-nilly making this video according to your Holy Spirit, what you told me to do. Please give me the words, Father, I love you, Lord. Please lead me and guide me to not forget stuff. In Jesus' name, amen. So you have to think of two parallel things right here. When the Father presents that contract, that's representative. The Father of the groom is, the, is representative as God the Father. And the groom is representative of Jesus Christ. And the contract is representative of the covenant that we enter in. See, when we get saved, okay, this is why there's a huge problem with once saved, always saved and things like that. We're entering into a covenant with the Lord. We're entering into a covenant. We're saying, you know, we want to enter into this marriage. We agree to these terms and conditions. We agree to keep your commandments. Jesus said himself, if you love me, then keep my commandments. So we're, we're agreeing to do that when we get saved. So the marriage is representative of when we first get saved and come to the Lord. We're agreeing to the, the terms of the, the contract if we drink the cup. So once the groom presents the bride and with the cup and she drinks it she's saying yeah i agree and, and that's representative as well of communion and so jesus said you know in, in the last supper he said to you know he taught his disciples to take communion he said to do it often in remembrance of him every time we take communion we're saying to him again we agree to the terms and the conditions of this agreement of this uh, marriage that we have entered in with the Lord we we are married to the Lord right now today 
If you're saved, if you are saved, you are married to the Lord right now, male and female. And I'll, I'll put a scripture on, on the screen about how men are married to Christ as well. So anyway, we are saying every time we take communion, that's, that's what it means. We're taking that cup again. And it's a lot of things about that last supper that I'm going to get into. For instance, after they would take that cup, the groom would then present some of the, the guests would get gifts at that time and the, the bride would also get gifts at that time. Okay, so what do these gifts represent to us now? It's things like prophecy, you know, helps, all the, the fivefold ministry. And I'll put that on the screen, you know, different types of gifts that the Lord gives us today. And the Bible says gifts. That's why it says the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, the gifts of the Spirit. Because these are gifts that God gives us today. We Many people have these gifts. I have the gift of prophecy. I have the gift of, of teaching. The Lord taught me that many years ago. He, through many ways, I'm not going to get into that. That I have the gift of teaching and I have the gift of prophecy. So many of us have different gifts. A lot of people have discerning of spirits gifts. You know, that, that's another video. I'm not going to get into all of the gifts. But that's the type of gifts that we get when we enter into this, this covenant. And some of them are gifts of speaking in tongues as well. So anyway, and not everybody has the same gifts. So if you don't have these gifts or, you know, you say, well, I can't speak in tongues or whatever. Not everybody has the same gifts. Speaking in tongues is referred to as a gift. So there's different gifts that we get when we enter into a covenant with the Lord, just like a bride. And then the groom would tell the bride that he is not going to drink of that cup again until they are together in his father's house. He says, I will not drink of this cup anew until I am with you in, a, in, a, in my father's house. And what did Jesus say at the Last Supper? He tells the disciples, he tells them that I will not drink of this cup again until we are together in my father's house. And so I just want to point something out right there as well, because I'm not going to probably remember every lie to shoot down as I do this video. But one of the lies I want to shoot down is the fact that some people think the bride is all females. That is so insane. The Bible tells us clearly there is no male or female in Christ. There is no Jew or Greek. So what God is saying by that is it doesn't matter if you are Israelite blood by blood or is or you not an Israelite by blood. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It says we are all one in Christ. So he's telling these same marriage terms to the disciples, men. Okay, so anybody that is teaching that the bride is females only or even just one female, which is even worse, you know, they're they're not telling the truth. So when this takes place, they was immediately married at that point, right then and there. The marriage was was done. It just wasn't consummated. So in a Galilean wedding, and let me say this too before I forget, Jesus was a Galilean. And so were the disciples they were Galilean and the Bible even talks about how Mary Magdalene followed the Lord when he was in Galilee so she was probably also a Galilean so when he would use this terminology they understood him because he was using terms that was familiar with their customs their culture their traditions so for us you know we don't really understand all these things because we we're not Galileans so that's why the Lord has moved me to make this video, praise God. So please lo soberly listen to, to what I'm saying. So then the marriage was done, but it's in two parts. In a Galilean ceremony, there's the marriage. And then there's another part that I'm going to get into. It's not like us here. We just have one wedding. It's one day and we're done. Not with Galilean. So when you, when you vow to marry somebody, it, it takes some time. It's not done overnight. It's not done in a weekend. So once all of this was done, then they would go their separate ways for a year. The groom would go, he would tell his bride that he is going to prepare a place for her in his father's house. And that's the way that they would do the weddings. He would go then to build up on uh, his father's house to build rooms, to build rooms like like uh, with us, there's many rooms, there's many mansions in heaven. And Jesus said, what? I go to prepare a place for you. That's why he said that. 
Okay, so he he left to go prepare a place for us, and that was the vow that he made to the saints two thousand about two thousand years ago. And the bride is told that she needs to occupy until he returns. So what does that mean? Let's get into this, some of these terminologies. So the bride is then uh, to you know get her wedding garments. That's why so many scriptures of, in the Bible about garments and how we need to have clean garments. We need to have white garments because she is supposed to wear white. Now I've heard before, I'm just going to throw this out there in case if anybody knows this. I don't want them commenting this. And they'll say, oh, queen such and such. I can't remember which queen it was. She created white wedding dresses. That's not true, okay? In a Galilean wedding, the wife, the, um, the wife, the bride, I'll say bride, she would wear white. So she has to go get her white garments. And, in, and to get these specialized garments, it took a while. It would take them months to get these garments, actually. It took a long time. And then it took a long time for the groom to build a house on... Uh, his father's you know to build rooms on his father's house and then he was also responsible for the groom was re responsible for um, the ceremony the food and you know making every making sure everything like that was was ready the father the father of the groom was the overseer he was like the just the overseeing everything and making sure you know everything is being done but it was really the the groom that really did the work and so that's why with Jesus he says that he's doing the work he's building the, he's preparing the matches he's doing this he's doing that you know and and that's the relationship that we have with him and so as Christians we've been waiting a long time for for his return now we are already married to him so when the bride would get ready She's running around getting her things together and she knows he's getting everything together. So the wedding could take place at any time. That is understood in a Galilean ceremony and a Galilean wedding that at any time that groom can come back and say, you know, we're going to have this wedding right right now. So she understood that things took a while and that it wasn't going to happen right right away because she wasn't ready. And so there would come a time when she was ready, when everybody was ready, her bridesmaids was ready, and because they had to have their outfits too. Everybody had to have outfits, the bride and the bridesmaids. They had to have their garments. So, so, so keep that in mind. We have to have clean garments. That has to do with righteousness, cleanliness, salvation. Okay, so that's why once saved, always say anything that encourages people to live in sin is so detrimentally wrong. You know, it's just, it's so wrong because God is very clear on the fact that we need to get clean garments. So everybody had to get their garments and everybody in the community also had to be ready. The bride would get her hair done and she would sleep in those white garments every night. Every night she would have on her garments, she would be ready because the groom would call for the bride in the middle of the night. And that's why the Bible says that he is coming like a thief in the night. And it says for those of us that is ready and watching, that's why it's important to be ready and watching. Because I've gotten that too. I've gotten some crazy comments. You know, God bless you all. I'm not, I don't want to get down on you guys too much. Don't, don't, um, you know, take this the wrong way. But some people just don't know the word of God. And they, they say, well, we don't really need to be watching as long as we Christians, you know, we don't have to be watching for the end days and everything like that. And you are so wrong. It's so many scriptures in the Bible that says we have to be watching. We need to understand the seasons. We need to understand the times that we're living in. And this is the season right now for the groom to come for his bride. We are in the season right now. So you need to be awake and aware of that. And so anyway... All the people had to be ready. She's sleeping in these garments every day. She's ready because she knows that he can come any day in the middle of the night to, to come get her. So she's, she's in her white garment. She's ready. And we're ready with our salvation, with our joy. We're expecting. We understand that this is the season. Okay, before it wasn't the season. And I had a prophetic dream. And if I can hunt it down, I'll put it in the description box where I was shown that we would be able to discern the season, that it was a time that was going to come where we would know the season. And no man knows the day or the hour. 
Okay, let me say that too. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for reminding me of that. Because the groom never knew when he would go get his bride. Only the father of the groom would know. And the father of the groom would not tell anybody, not his wife, not the groom, not his friends, not anybody. Only he knew. That's why Jesus said that no man knows the day or the hour, only the father. He said, only my father, which art in heaven, only the father, right? So it's the same way with a Galilean wedding. So Jesus is ready. The groom is ready. Got everything ready. The bride is ready. Everybody's waiting. When is it going to happen? And then he goes to his father. He says, I got everything ready, father. Everything, the, everything is ready. The feast is ready. All the people, the saints are ready. Everything's ready. And he's in the father. It's like, not yet. It's on his timing. So that's why anyone who is telling you a rapture date is a false prophet. Okay, they are a false prophet. And let me make sure I say that because I've gotten a couple of people already, which is why I got confirmation to make this video, who seem to think that I'm trying to say a certain date and I, they trying to say, I've heard some people say that I said it's going to happen this year. Um, somebody was trying to say something about I said it was going to happen in a couple of weeks. That's a lie from the pit of hell because I understand the customs of a Galilean wedding. I would never, I do not give rapture dates, but I understand we're in the season. We're in the season to be ready. Jesus is saying to us, everything is ready. The prophecies that was to take place before, like I said in my last video, they have taken place. Everything in heaven is ready. The wedding supper of the lamb is ready. The mansions are ready. Many of us have seen that. I've been in my mansion. My daughter has been in our mansion in prophetic dreams. Hallelujah. Everything is ready. There was a time in the past when he was showing me the mansion. It wasn't ready, but he showed me point blank. It's ready right now. Things are ready. We are in the season. Now, if God the father says, son, go get your bride. And that happens this year or next year or whenever. And I can hear it now. You know, all my people who don't believe in a rapture at all or people who don't believe, you know, they believe different things and a pre, uh, what is it called? Pre-trib rapture. I don't believe in none of that. I'm explaining to you the customs of a Galilean wedding. And I'm telling you, we are in the season that we should be watching because that is what God has led me prophetically. And that's exactly what I'm doing. Now, if he tells me something else, then we'll go in that direction. But right now, that is what God has been telling me, that we are in the season to be prepared and getting our garments ready. Now, if he can come back this year or next year, whatever, and I'll get into that, what I mean by him coming back. I'll, I'll talk some more about that anyway. So anyway, we, no one knows. No one knows the day or the hour. So that groom is waiting. His bride is ready. She's, she's made her garments ready. The Bible says that, made our garments ready. And they're waiting. And then all of a sudden, one day, the father of the groom, which is God the Father, he tells his son, go get your bride. The groom would be sleeping in the same room with the father, with the groomsmen. Everybody would be there. They would all be ready. They would have their garments ready and having all their clothes on and everything. And the bride and the same thing. She would have everything ready. They would sleep in the same room with her, her bridesmaids and everybody would be ready. So then the first thing that the groom and his uh, groomsmen would do is they would grab their shofars. Okay, what does shofars mean? That's in the Bible as trumpets. That's why the Bible says Jesus and the angels will be blowing trumpets. And all ties back to the Galilean wedding. And they would blow, they would go out in the streets and they would blow those trumpets and then everybody that was ready would come. The bride would be ready. She would immediately run out. And all of the people in the, the village that was ready would immediately run out. And this was, remember, this is a time when there was great Christian persecution. Great Christian persecution. So a wedding feast. Oh, there's free food and it's gifts because the guests get gifts. The bride gets gifts. Everybody gets gifts. It's a wonderful, ex exuberant time. So everybody wants to be at this wedding. And some people, though, well, you would think everybody, but the Bible, I'm going to get into some of that. Some people don't want to go. So anyway, 
they would all come out and immediately go into the feast now getting into some of those people that that want to be ready they was doing their own thing and they didn't want to go to the wedding they weren't thinking it's a big deal you know they and that's that's where you see a lot of professing christians today they're not studying the coming of the lord they don't even want to believe in the coming of the lord because they love this world they have been mesmerized by the things in this earth and you'll hear them say things like well i'm trying to go to school and get my degree i want to be a lawyer i want to be a doctor they're making plans for this earth they're not studying the plans of the kingdom of god and that's exactly what that means and so when this time comes these are professing saints those virgins that's another example god gives us examples throughout the bible when you read the word of, of god understand these things based on what i'm telling you and let these words come alive to you because even with the virgins that is why you have these virgins all the virgins are, are christians every single virgin is christians but some of them have oil in their lap. They wait in. They making sure they got their oil in their lap. And that's another thing. The bride and her bridesmaids would have oil lamps. And they would have oil in their lamps. That They would have to have that. And so when they went out to meet the groomsmen in the middle of the night, they was expected to have a lit oil lamp as well. And so what does that mean? It has to do we watching and waiting. We exuberant. Our heart is ready. We know what season we in. We know this could happen any day. We are excited for the Lord. Hallelujah. And we looking forward to his return. So we have our, our lamps ready and everything like that. So what is going to happen? A lot of people not going to be ready. That's why the Bible gives parables about how they're not going to be ready. And God says, the God, the Father will look at the, at the wedding and say, wow, well, you know, this is a great feast, but it's not that many people. And then he will send forth his servants and he will tell them to get the people from the highways and the byways and come in here and, and fill up this, this uh, wedding supper so we can have this wedding supper of the Lamb. And they will bring in a huge harvest. I have seen it many times many times and that is why you have this group that is going to be raptured and i've said that again um you know because a lot of people don't think the 144,000 are going to be raptured and i'm telling you they are it's the same way with a galilean wedding they're raptured they're sent back they're sent back. He's going to send his servants to go back because of this, the wedding is not full and they're going to bring in a huge harvest and when he comes to, let me not forget this part, and everybody goes into the wedding supper of the Lamb, the door is slammed shut and no one is able to get into that wedding feast. No one. So that is why God literally showed me, I have had dreams about this, and I'll let me say it from the beginning. I used to think that only the 144,000 would go in this rapture type thing and I know I'm being kind of vague on that because it's a lot I can say about that, but it requires its own video. I don't want to get into that right now because this video is long enough as it is. But I used to think that only the 144,000 would go and then God himself straightened me out and started showing me prophetically that it is everyone who is ready. Everyone with clean garments, everyone that is ready will be in this move that that is coming this shift change this miraculous event where all these saints will get these miraculous abilities and everything like that so anyway these 144,000 though come back and i've seen prophetically that a lot of saints do not come back god literally showed me that they stay in heaven he showed me that i've done videos about that and I know what I'm saying is going to be hard for a lot of people to hear. They're not going to want to hear it. I'm not arguing with anybody. I'm telling you the difference between, um, I'm telling you the parallels in scripture with, with the wedding supper of the lamb, the parallels with the Galilean wedding. I'm trying to make all of this make sense to you guys. So this is the truth. Now, when is this going to happen? I don't know. It's not for me to know. I don't try to figure it out. But when the captain of the host of the Lord's army says, this is the season to make sure you prepare make sure your garments are ready. I say, yes, Lord, because it's not for me to argue with God and try to dictate things. If he says, be ready, we need to be ready. So anyway, and I understand that because I understand the Galilean wedding, praise God. And I understand that we need to have our garments and be excited and be exuberant for the season we in. So anyway, 
these 144,000, I'll just say servants, because the Bible uses the word servants. These servants go back and they bring in this harvest and, and then the wedding supper of the lamb takes place after these. So it doesn't take place right there. They have to go out and get these servants. Now, how long is that going to take? I've, I've heard people, you know, say this and that God has not given me that specifically. So I could tell you what I think, but I'm not even going to do that. So I'm not going to touch on that, how long it's going to take, but it's going to take some time, um, you know, some time, whatever time period that is. And they bring in this huge harvest to have the wedding supper of the Lamb. Now, what takes place in the wedding supper of the Lamb? That's the last thing I want to get into. In a Galilean wedding, the, the contract is already done. The only thing that needs to be done after that is there's a feast. And there's a lot of gifts that are given out and there is consummation of the marriage. So how does that parallel with us? So the door shed, everybody's in, they finally having this feast. The, all the guests and the bride are giving gifts. And this time the gifts are way better than the gifts that was given before. Hallelujah. And that is why now we can better understand why God keeps giving us the words gifts when he gives me these dreams of this shift change, he, he keeps using the word gifts. Okay. He, he says gifts. And I even see him in a dream as presents. I'm seeing all these presents. So that is why in these gifts that we are going to get in this next move of God, this shift that is coming, is going to be way more miraculous than anything. Not only that we have seen in our lifetime, but check this out better than anything our biblical ancestors have seen in their lifetime. And if you see two videos I did called, um, it's something about the title is something like superhero powers in the Bible. I'll put it in the description box. You really need to see that because it'll get you really excited when you really understand the types of anointings that they had and think that we are going to have stuff way better than what they had. Hallelujah. And another thing I want to say about gifts, it's a surprise. Some of us know some of the gifts that we're going to get, but and I've said this in other videos as well. And, and I know this God has not revealed to me. Hallelujah. I feel his presence on me right now. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. He has not revealed to me all the gifts that he would give me. So a lot of us don't know. A lot of us don't know, but I'm going to tell you, he's a big God. And if you watched a video I did recently, I talked about how he's our big God. There is nothing. Don't worry about if your prayers are too big for him. You want to pray big prayers right now because he's a big God. And he's going to be surprising us with some very wonderful gifts. And then when you enter into a marriage, what happens? You get a new name. That's why he said in Revelation, I will give you a stone with a new name in it. And what does it mean to consummate the marriage? I was thinking that one day, the thought just came in my mind and immediately the Lord answered me back. Like the second my thought was finished. And he said that it means to pray. That was his exact words. It means to pray. So, you know, what is going to take place at the wedding supper of the lamb? I'm going to go into what God has shown me personally. I've seen that dancing was taking place. He showed me that. He showed me that we was all going to be dressed so pretty and all kind of beautiful outfits and him as well. He's going to be going to people, talking to them. There's going to be a feast. Oh, the food is going to be phenomenal. I didn't get to taste any of it, but it looks so pretty. And the, the big, big giant banquet hall. Many of us have seen it. And so there's going to be a feast and everything like that. And are we going to say any type of vows and things like that? It's possible. I have heard other people say that, but in a Galilean wedding, it was not actually part of that. They would just kind of, they might, you know, they might've stood up and said a few words here and there, but it wasn't like an actual covenant thing. Cause that was already done. The covenant was already established. So, you know, I'm just pointing out the similarities. Now, if God does something new, he's God. You know, if he want to have us say different vows, then he's God. And, and when the marriage is completely established, we become joint heirs with the groom. That's why the Bible says we become joint heirs with Christ. 
Anyway, I love you all. Bye.